Pretty hard to forget. Pretty hard to forget. Okay. Why is that even so bad? I don't know. Did you see it? Did you see it? Okay, no problem. Okay, is that the one with the copyright? If there is some question from the audience, just to approach with Mike. Okay. What question? Okay. So, yeah. I mean, you know, I've done work in AI and we do work in AI. If it's not a good fit, I'm okay. It's, it's really for. Oh no, it's, it's super. I thought he was. Uh, I thought Mina was going to be on it. Super. Well, he said he's. he's uh, I'm able to. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. He's super. giving it to me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No. No. Father Augusto. But. <laughs> I'm noticing that I was going to say, I was just talking about. Are you taking confessions? No, 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 we are, we are just. Because of the. Yeah, the outcome. So probably it's not important. Yeah. So they can just go there. Yeah, 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 yeah. Part of the job. Okay. Okay. Just for you all to know that the first question that will come up to you, and we said that everyone should have a tweet at the beginning. Uh, once we once we turn to you, is how how do you define the responsible AI? So it should be sort of a Responsible AI. Quick answer. Quick answer. You don't have to bring a definition. You can say there is no definition, whatever you want. Now, okay, let's see whether we have someone over there. I mean, it's probably the music. Just bring your voice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Repeat what others say. And you can even invite them occasionally. One, two, three, one, two, three. Can I talk? Oh, yes, I have. I can talk to you. Hello, guten Morgen. Wie geht es dir? Buenos dias. Como están? Bonjour. And th thank you for waking up so early to come up for this crazy session. Yeah. I'm sure you, it will be worth it. <laughs> My name is Olga Cavalli. I come from Argentina, and we have our dear friend Radim uh, Vladimir Radunovic. He's from Serbia. From Serbia, yeah, from Diplo and, Foundation. And uh, he, of course, you know Vladi. He's from Diplo Foundation. I am the academic director of the South School of Internet Governance. Uh, so, 
Thank you for being with us this morning. The idea is to have a very interesting and interactive session with our experts here, with our panelists, and of course with you. The main issue that we will talk about today is applying human rights and ethics in responsible data governance and artificial intelligence. You may recall we organized a, a previous session related somehow to this one in, in the last IGF in, in Paris, in, in the nice UNESCO uh, main venue. And so this session intends to be somehow a continuation of what we discussed at that time. We have only two hours. We have seven, uh, well, we have eight experts, by the way. We have seven expert, expert and another expert in the, in the stage. The idea is go through some questions that we have prepared for our panelists and for you, the audience. And perhaps in two hours, we end up having more questions and more ideas that you can take home and develop with your own group, with your own stakeholder, with your own government. So that's the, that if, if, we, if we get that at the end of the, of the session, we would be very happy with that. So let me tell you some, some comments about what is this, this session about, applying human rights and ethics in artificial intelligence. We all know that artificial intelligence can contribute to addressing some of the world's most pressing problems, but also can lead to some inequality and problems, as, as all the technology that we have been um, using since the civilization exists, everything can be used for the good or for the bad. Uh, artificial intelligence can make people's lives easier, but it can also generate discrimination and bias. We all know several examples of that. So how do we develop and use artificial intelligence in a human-centric and trustworthy manner? That is what we want to discuss with you today. How to make sure that the data used by artificial intelligence is reliable, accurate, complete enough as not to generate discrimination. Also, the use of data is one of the main themes of this IGF here in Berlin. How to avoid privacy and data protection breaches in accessing and processing the large amounts of data that are the core of artificial intelligence? How do we make sure that there is transparency and accountability in algorithms used in artificial intelligence? Where are we now? Where are we going? How human rights and ethical frameworks are related or are being used in the development of, of artificial intelligence. So we have seen several ethical frameworks developed in different organizations, uh, OECD, ITU, European Commission, IEEE. We will review them in a moment so you can have a sense of uh, what are they about. But um, uh, how do they relate with the developments that are being done now, uh, nowadays? Um, do you want to add something to that? Should we go to no, I think you can present uh, okay. uh, the guests. So well, we, for, for, we have you, of course, and we have a very uh, fantastic panel of distinguished experts, and I will briefly introduce them. Uh, we have Ms. Lisa Dyer. Lisa is the Director of Policy at the Partnership of Artificial Intelligence. Welcome, Lisa. We have Ms. Caroline Ewan. She's the Director of Technology uh, policy at Microsoft. Welcome, Caroline. We have Sarah Kinden. Sarah, welcome. Uh, she's the uh, technologist and researcher at ICT Africa and PhD student uh, of University of Dundee and Mozilla. Welcome. Uh, uh, Reverend Augusto Sampini Davis. He is the director of development and faith of the Holy See, the Vatican. Welcome, Augusto. Um, Mr. Mina Hanna, he is the chair of the IEEE USA Artificial Intelligence and Autonomous Systems Policy Committee. Welcome, Mina. Ms. Peggy Hicks, Peggy, she is the director at the United Nations Human Rights Office. And Mr. Yoichi Ida, Mr. Yoichi Ida, he is from the Ministry of Internal Affairs and Communications of Japan. Welcome, Yoichi. No, I think this, this already promises quite a, quite a discussion with, the, with another guest, which we are not going to mention another now. Another guest in the, in the We'll stage. keep it as a, as a yeah, curiosity. Um, looking at the, the last year, what we had uh, in, in uh, Paris, the discussion, there were a couple of interesting outcomes, well, uh, questions, food for thought, that came out from, uh, from the discussion. So, for instance, we had um, um, sort of a takeaway that the code is a reflection 
of the people who have coded and influenced the, uh, the code, and that, that the ethics changes um, over time, it changes over geographical borders, that the ethics and the concept understanding of ethics is not the same in different regions by different generations. Uh, so is there such a thing as a global ethics? Um, then the next question was that um, uh, if there even could be a sim single set of principles that we agree on a global level, that means we would need to have a global approach and uh, sort of a single guidance for everyone who is developing the AI and using the AI. Then that um, the professional ethics is needed. And there were uh, references to the doctors or the lawyers which might have their ethical code. And one of the open questions, which we are going to throw back, back to the panel later and to all of you, is whether the engineers, the technical community has or should have the, the ethical code as well of some kind. Um, one of the principles or the, the, um, uh, the points that was raised last year was also that we need the fairness as one of the, the, the first um, um, points in the approach to responsible AI. Which, what does it mean? It means that the AI should treat all the people equally. Now, how, how do we come up to that? Is that possible? Um, then the interpretability of the algorithms. There's a huge discussion. Can we actually interpret the results, explain how the AI came to certain, certain uh, results and, and uh, decisions, if you wish? <clears throat> Is there um, human responsibility and accountability for any decision taken by AI? A huge question which we, I think, started discussing already when the, the, the smart car killed the first person. And then, are the laws actually um, sufficient? Or are they becoming too slow comparing to the pace of development of AI? And do we need ethics or any sort of a different approach, principles, which, could, which would go hand in hand with laws, or even maybe replace them? Should we uh, rethink the whole approach to the legal uh, setting of the, of the uh, uh, AI. Uh, and then lastly, um, instead of maybe, or building up on the laws, some sort of a principles like the UN Declaration on Human Rights, or something similar might become the lead instrument for, for the responsible AI. I stop there. Uh, I, Olga, I'm, I'm sure you want to run through the, 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 the many uh, initiatives that we had. As I, as I explained before, and I, as Vlada was explaining, there are several initiatives to review the ethics related with artificial intelligence. I will go briefly through a very nice graph that Vlada has developed for us this morning. Uh, I, we have divided them into three main categories, human-centered, responsible, and mechanism. If we can go to the first one, please. Human-centered is the lawfulness of the rules, respect of human dignity, a fair artificial intelligence, safe and secure artificial intelligence. Um, I see people taking pictures. I think we can share this with, with the audience afterwards, right? Uh, artificial intelligence should serve people, the society, and the planet. It should respect for human rights and freedom. It should be ethical, and it should benefit for society. So. Uh, we have gone through them. Most of the, of the different initiatives have similarities and some uh, common points that are summarized in this, in this graph. Especially this part is the, those human center focused. If we can go to the other category, please. It, uh, responsible artificial intelligence. It should be accountable and there should be accountability and transparency in responsibility, sorry, in, in developing uh, the, the artificial intelligence. There should be transparency. Uh, artificial intelligence should be a solution, not a, a problem to society and human uh, people. And it should be explainable, should be easy to understand, and everyone should be able to catch the benefits. And the other category is uh, mechanisms. Which mechanisms are there? for the development of artificial intelligence, prepare the workforce so people should be trained for that. Human is uh, control over artificial intelligence and not artificial intelligence controlling the humans, like many movies that we have seen since many years. Uh, regulate the development and use of artificial intelligence. Should be regulation, how much regulation we need, how that would be de uh, developed. 
multidisciplinary dialogue on artificial intelligence. Uh, there is also several references uh, and import the importance of a multi-stakeholder approach to discuss all the things related with the development of artificial intelligence, cooperation between existing initiatives, so they should be somehow linked in, in between the different initiatives so they don't work totally separate from each other. Focus on privacy, safety, security, especially in relation with the data that is collected and managed. The rise awareness of artif on artificial intelligence that everyone knows, not only governments, companies, civil society, the technical community, and support that artificial intelligence uh, should be a benefit for society. So we have gone through all the initiatives that are related with ethics and artificial intelligence, and these are the main categories and the main points that uh, all of them focus on. So we wanted to, to summarize them for you before we go to our three main questions. Should I read them? I think so. Okay. So we have uh, thought about uh, three main questions that we will present to our experts and, of course, to you, the audience, and we go one by one. We have about half an hour for each of them, but we will manage the time so we have time for interaction with you. The first one is, what is a trust trustworthy, oh, that's a difficult question for a Spanish-speaking person, <laughs> trustworthy and responsible artificial intelligence, especially with regard to data governance, which is, as I said, one of the, of the themes of this, um, of this IGF in Berlin. Uh, the second question is, what is the role of human rights and legal instruments and ethical frameworks in ensuring trustworthy and responsible data governance and uh, artificial intelligence? Are there any lessons learned from existing frameworks? And it's interesting that we have reviewed the main, the main issues that are being developed uh, about ethics uh, for artificial intelligence in different organizations and debate spaces. And the third question is how to cross the bridge between defining human rights and ethical frameworks and implementing them in artificial intelligence systems and the sustainable development goals. What is the role of different stakeholders and how can they work together, as I said before, to achieve the best results for all of us? So, go for the first We one. move on to the first question. Before jumping on the first question, I just wanted to remind you of the, of the rules of the, of the game or the, the ways to interact. Um, the, probably the best music that you can hear in the morning to relax is jazz. So this is going to be the approach of the session today. We're going to jazz a lot, but we need your contributions to that. Uh, we'll make sure that the questions are provocative enough. You have a number of ways to interact. Certainly, the microphones are there. You can queue. You can sit in the front row as well. Uh, there'll be a screen later on, which, uh, besides this one, which will enable you to post your comments, but please be active and stop us, because otherwise we can... Yesterday we had a preparation session with these people, and it, it, the prep session took an uh, hour and a half or even two, hour, two hours, right? So I'm sure we can continue uh, much longer, so don't be shy. One of the, the first inputs that we want to hear from you is actually sort of the last question of the day as well, which is what is the level of responsibility of actors uh, for responsible AI? So we know that it's a shared responsibility, that's a buzzword, that's fine. But who takes what, what, what uh, level of responsibility in this, this constellation? You can uh, use the Mentimeter, so use smartly the devices you have over there. Go to uh, www.menti.com, use the code 272900, and just vote. Just try to rate the level of responsibility of different actors. We'll get back to the results a little bit later uh, in the discussion, but while you're doing that, I would like to start with the first question. So again, the first policy question is, what is a trustworthy, well, it's equally complicated to a server, what is a trustworthy and responsible AI, especially with regards to data governance? In a way, we are trying to decode what are we talking about. And I'll start with, uh, as we agreed, with uh, ah, a tweet, an extended tweet, if you wish, but not a blog, please. Uh, how do you define? the responsible AI. What is the responsible AI? I'll start not from the special guest, but from, from maybe from the left, Yoichi. It is on, I think. Yeah, okay, thank you very much. So, uh, thank you very much for the question. Uh, for me, personally, a responsible AI is a kind of AI uh, based on the, designed on the uh, uh, concept of human Centeredness. Uh, we started the discussion about uh, uh, AI 
uh, development uh, uh, back in three years ago and uh, in the international uh, fora and uh, 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 the, uh, as uh, all of you know, recognize, uh, we had uh, uh, discussions uh, in uh, OECD and also this year G20. So, uh, uh, as you know, uh, and just shown on the slide uh, in the uh, introductory uh, presentation, uh, we, we, uh, the government uh, agreed on the uh, AI uh, principles, which includes uh, inclusivity human centrality and transparency, uh, robustness and accountability. These are the uh, basis of the uh, responsible AI or trustworthy AI. And uh, uh, I believe uh, uh, more uh, or less uh, we share the common understanding. So for me, uh, uh, the responsible AI is uh, uh, how to, to implement uh, these, uh, uh, the, the AIs uh, uh, which uh, implement these uh, principles, and uh, uh, we uh, are now uh, discussing how to realize these uh, individual principles now. That, that, that is the, the whole uh, final discussion on how to come to that, but I think this was quite, uh, quite useful to outline the main principles, including the human-centered. Sarah. Yeah, so for me, I'll go back to the definition of trustworthy from the English dictionary, which says it should be something we should be able to rely upon as honest and truthful. So when I'm looking at AI, this is, these are the key things. Do you rely upon it? Is it honest? Is it truthful? And you look at it from all, because AI relies on huge amounts of data. So from data collection to processing to visualization, are we ensuring these things? And to mention some of the things, I actually like the European Commission's um, definition and how they look at trustworthy AI. They talk about lawfulness. It should respect all the laws and regulations. It should be ethical, respecting all the principles and values, and also robust. So it's technically robust, but also it does not ignore the social context. Thank you. I like the, well, the, there's a bunch of others, but uh, the, the honesty and truthfulness, that's, that's quite an interesting approach. Good. Augusto. Thank you. I think it will switch on automatically. Huh? No, then try with the other one. Thank you. Um, for me, responsible AI is um, one that merges the two concepts. So um, artificial intelligence. Artificial, it, it's on the technical aspect. And intelligence is more on the human aspect, what we call the anthropological aspect. But because intelligence is about learning and learning how to take decisions, um, we learn how to take decisions not merely artificially or not merely from a technical perspective, but in a, in a, in a comprehensive human context. And for me, a responsible AI is the one that develops uh, the technical aspect alongside the human aspect, which is a common aspect. It's not a ind individually human, but because we are social beings. Or put differently, an irresponsible AI will be an AI that is focused merely on the technicalities, on the improvement, on the ability of the technology, disregarding basic human, uh, not just values, but ba the basic human context, such as, for example, the collective good or how we are, we are uh, working together, how we resolve our conflicts together, uh, how we, we, we sort out our illnesses about health. So, when you, when you ask poor people about what, what, I'm a priest, so when you ask people, well, let us pray, what do you want to pray for? They always say, the first thing that they say is health. Well, guess what? Artificial intelligence affects the way we're resolving health. The second thing that they pray is for their beloved people, and, and particularly for, for, for those they have conflict with. Guess what? AI is involved in the conflict issues. So, this is, we need to include, a responsible AI is the one who includes the artificial with the intelligent aspect and, and they move along. And therefore, from a, from a governmental perspective, from a data pers government perspective, is the one who helps the developers, companies and users to go in, on, on this way. Thanks a lot. Qu quite an interesting uh, twist of what is an irresponsible AI, but we can get back to that later. Uh, Mina. <coughs> That's working. Um, well, I will do, I will do probably, I will take the path of the philosophical argument. 
Uh, my from position. the IEEE, which is absolutely no. Better. That's a, that's no, go, go. I mean, we're representative of the technical co of the tech community, um, and uh, but I will take the philosophical path. Um, I think if you try to if you try to define what is responsible, what I have argued yesterday is you have to look at what is irresponsible and then deem the opposite of that as the outcome that you want to get to. So if you want to define fairness, you define what is unfair and then say, oh, okay, I can see that the opposite of that, you know, by contrast, that's what could be fair. If you want to define, you know, uh, um, so in the context of the question that was asked, I think irresponsible and the worst transgression in the conversation on the definition of AI is anthropomorphizing AI. So projecting human, you know, uh, properties or characteristics on the AI, and that's and that kind of falls under moral outsourcing, what we call moral outsourcing, meaning that if there are decisions that are deemed to be harmful to a party because they have been the subject of a use of an automated decision-making system, AI broadly defined, then you say that the responsibility doesn't fall on the party that designed the tool or the party that had curated the data and so on and so forth or designed the algorithm and so on, but it falls on, you know, on AI. AI made me do it kind of, a, kind of an argument. That's, that's irresponsible in my opinion. And I think that should be kind of you know, a platform or kind of a springboard for all, all our conversations on how do we govern. If we have that in the, as a backdrop for our conversations, for our deliberations on how we write laws, how we write ethical principles, how we define that entire conversation, knowing that artificial intelligence is nothing merely, you know, is merely nothing but, you know, an artifact. That's the, or, the origin of the word artificial. You know, artifact, form of art. It is something that we design, that we create. But if we assume that, you know, it's more than that, you know, and that's kind of the part of the responsibility of the narrative, right? When we just say it's robots, it's mm. whatever. It's not that it doesn't have the same agency, doesn't have the same cognitive you know, properties as humans. It doesn't reason like humans. So that's very important to define what should be responsible. And that's actually our responsibility in defining and communicating about AI. And, and, and thanks for taking the philosophical uh, <clears throat> view. Uh, and uh, if, if I get it correctly, then in a way, responsible AI is about responsible people that are behind it. Huh? Uh, and we have the artifact there, but we'll get back to the artifact at the end of the, of the session. Uh, Lisa. Good morning. I actually want to take it a little bit philosophical as well. Um, I think that actually all of the actors up there should approach any work they're doing in this space with empathy and compassion. Empathy and compassion for the people who will be affected by AI, those who are frightened about losing their jobs, those who are not invited to the table to have these types of discussions. Empathy and compassion for those who are um, biased as a result of some poor design decisions. So I think in a short tweet, I would just say empathy and compassion is fundamental to responsible AI. Thank you for tweeting, not blogging. Eh? <laughs> I was going to say, I, I don't think uh, everybody's on Twitter here. Uh -huh. um, so I, I'll try to stick to the rules and say, for me, responsible AI is something that my grandmother understands, my teacher can explain, and I'm not worried about it being applied to my children. And that means it has to be transparent, understandable, and accountable. Good tweet. Thank you. So what can I say that hasn't been said before? Um, you know, for us, responsible AI is really simple. It is about uh, bringing technology to the table that's human-centered, designed in a way that augments human capabilities and not replacement. Um, it, it's interesting that the term artificial, I think, puts the emphasis on the wrong thing that this is something that is always going to be compared to human. We think of artificial intelligence really as computational intelligence, and it's really people who are behind it. So from the perspective of how do you make that technology realize its potential and be adopted more broadly, we then use the term trustworthiness. At Microsoft, we created um, the Center on Trustworthy Computing in the beginning of the 2000s. 
because we said why trustworthiness? Because it's important to bring technology to the table that earns the trust of the people. We don't tell you you need to trust us. We need to demonstrate how, what are the properties of a technology, of, um, in this particular case, computational intelligence, that will foster trust and enable its broader adoption. One thing interesting that hasn't really been talked about this morning is the use of AI for good, right? There's lots of, you know, conversations out there about negative applications of AI. So we put a challenge out there in terms of AI for good, in terms of how AI can be used to address sustainability issues, accessibility issues, um, human rights issues, and how to AI can be a part of the solution as well. Um, and I think that's a conversation that's really not out there. So responsibility and trustworthiness. Okay. I, I got the impression that um, we would feel that responsible AI is something that the AI that we would love to have in our family. So, you know, part of the family that we can really trust and be close and, you know, have empathy and all of that you mentioned. Olga, do you have any reflections? Uh, well, I took some notes as the, our dear panelists were speaking and uh, I, I got some words. Honesty, inclusion, fairness, compassion, empathy, transparency, accountability, and trust. Uh, so nothing is related with technology. You see, everything is related with how the humans approach the technology. I think it's interesting to, to see that what, what we are trying to find is a way to use the technology in the best way for, for humanity and, and for people. Uh, and uh, let's see how the technology evolves and that we really can achieve that and use the artificial intelligence always for the good. Uh, should we see if we have some questions from the audience or from... It would be interesting to hear from you as well, yeah, what, what you think. Uh, so what, what is uh, responsible AI for you, for you and how would you define it? Uh, that I forgot to say at the beginning that we also have, of course, the remote participants. Or again, we are remote and they're on the right place. And uh, June is there to help us. Is there any reflection? Not yet. Okay. Yeah. You have uh, a yeah, mic sure, You can take the mic sure. and uh, please introduce yourself. Uh, clearly so that the transcribers can take it. Okay. Uh, good morning. Thank you, first of all. My name is Deborah. I come from Italy, and I'm a trainer in human rights education. And I'm here with the youth IGF and as youth delegate from the youth department of the Council of Europe. And uh, uh, I was surprised that when you were giving out the definition, there were people who were like, focusing on giving definition of trustworthy or responsible, nobody really gave out uh, the definition of what human rights are. Uh, because sometimes when we are in this kind of environment, it's like, okay, we have to care about human rights, it's the right thing to do. But we kind of forgot that human rights are universal, inalienable, oh my case, really difficult, I'm Italian, I got my problem too. Um, and they are interdependent and interrelated. So sometimes they come at the losing hand of all these speeches about technologies. And uh, it's also funny for me when we talk about artificial intelligence as something that is separate for human, is human made. So why artificial intelligence can be educated um, and you know, we educate them with data and working on them. So why among the things with whom we can educate artificial intelligence can't we introduce human rights principle? And uh, how can we find ways to do that? When it comes to responsibility, European Commission has this project called Ledger Project that uh, calls for young uh, tech expert, experts in general to submit projects that will uh, help in the creation of our more sustainable like internet but there are only 32 funded projects or something like that so why can't we make the people who got the power the economical power more accountable in putting money in this kind of initia initiatives because sometimes it seems when we talk about these things are so difficult to make or you know just put the money in it there are people who are experts use them and do things. It's not such 
um, complicated or so much philosophical. It's something that affects all of us, all our communities, and it's something that is doable. So that was my Thank you. And, and you actually raised something that we, we scratched yesterday evening and we agreed we are not going to raise the funding today. No, I'm kidding. We are. We are going to raise it in the last part because we'll probably need about five hours of discussion on the funding and ethics of funding and so on. But we will get back to that. I don't know if anyone wants to react quickly on, on, on this one. So <clears throat> the human rights and principles, we mentioned that as one of the takeaways from the uh, last year's session, uh, is, the, is something that's encoded in a human rights approach actually what reflects what we are talking about, the, the, the human responsibility in that one. Does anyone want to take it? Yeah. Uh, thanks for that. And, and coming from the UN Human Rights Office, it's, yeah, it's nice to, to hear it from the floor as well. I mean, I think as the introduction put forward, I mean, there's a lot of discussion about ethics and human rights that pits them against each other in some way. And I just wanted to start this off by saying that I think the, the commentator is, is absolutely correct. Human rights is part of the discussion the same way ethics is part of the discussion, and they each have fundamental roles to play. Ethics, uh, my friend Ed Santo tells us, uh, is about what we should and should not do. Human rights, legally binding, universal, are about what we can and cannot do. And we need the human rights framework to help us do the, the, the ethical things that we want. We've got, and there's a wonderful chart from uh, Berkman Klein that, that shows the interface of the an incredible number of ethical conversations and principles that have been developed around AI. But the reality is we're still all in this room wondering how can we make this real? What, will, what impact are all those principles having on the ground? And that's why we're talking about regulation. And ultimately, we need to look at human rights as that foundational uh, bearing that can, that can allow the ethical discussions that we've had to be realized in real time for real people in the ways that will protect human rights on a day-to-day -day basis. Thanks a lot. And, and what comes to my mind is that we, we keep talking about the relations to human rights and the, and the principles, but I don't see any reflection on how the economic aspects or geopolitical aspects impact that. It, it, we might end up with a nice wish list. Yes, we want all these human rights principles, but reality about many other human rights is not really bright. So I wonder maybe, Yoichi or, or Carolyn, if you want to uh, briefly reflect on the economic uh, commercial aspects of, of uh, how do we actually, what, are there any principles that are impacted by the economy and the, and the geopolitics in a way, if you wish? Yuchi. Yeah, thank you very much for a very difficult question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, from the probably government perspective, uh, yeah, we understand, you know, uh, there should be a kind of very universal uh, foundation for uh, ethical aspects or uh, Mm, a human rights aspect uh, uh, should be built in uh, AI development, but uh, we often find, you know, uh, those uh, aspects are also accompanied with uh, the diversity from coming from the culture or history or uh, so, uh, society conditions. So when we come up to the very high level uh, standards, uh, when we look at the ethical uh, aspect or human rights aspect, uh, we maybe uh, reach um, a kind of common understanding uh, what are the uh, human rights and what are the uh, ethics. But when we talk about uh, more into details, uh, we always face with difficulties uh, talking about the differences and the diversities in culture, history, and uh, a lot of factors coming from uh, societal conditions. So uh, I, I cannot uh, find the answer how to, to promote the uh, economic uh, investment uh, in that uh, to, to promote uh, that uh, uh, aspect, but. Uh, uh, from our point of view, uh, yes, there exist a lot of difficulties when we look at the ethical and the human rights aspect. I think um, one way to look at that is how do we make sure that the potential and the uh, benefits for <clears throat> that will be brought about by AI can be enjoyed and spread um, equally um, across. So from that perspective, there's 
two different ways to look at it. One is to ensure that the um, uh, that everyone has the appropriate skills and training in order to participate in this new um, ecosystem. And so we've been doing a fair amount of work with respect to how to look at um, training um, uh, in terms of right, right all the way from uh, elementary school education in terms of STEM, not just mathematics, you know, et cetera, but also the ability to do analytical thinking um, and also, going back to something that Lisa said a little bit earlier, empathetic and also problem solving, because those two go hand in hand. It goes back to the human aspect of implementing the technology. So uh, we're doing a fair amount of work with respect to training um, and lifelong learning with respect to that. Uh, a second aspect, when you start to look at the question and in terms of making sure that the benefits are shared inclusively, is to make sure that the technology as well as the data underlying the technology can be shared. Uh, so from that perspective, we've made a number of data sets available for research and also otherwise. As a specific example, we're working with the um, OECD as they're formulating their AI policy observatory to share data. There's two sets of data there in terms of the uh, Microsoft Academic Graph, looking at um, uh, publications where collaborations are taking place, where innovation is being spread. And then secondly, the LinkedIn economic data, which looks at um, the economic opportunities, training, migration, talent, skills development, supply and demand, you know, et cetera. We've also launched an initiative to, um, to start an, a conversation on how to share data more broadly. And the conversation here is you talk about data sharing, but then there are issues about organizations not knowing what data can be shared, what data should be shared, and what are some of the mechanisms, et cetera, that can enable that conversation to occur more holistically. That's another part of responsible data governance that isn't really discussed more holistically in an integrated manner. And thanks for raising the, the question of the data, because I think that's, that brings us back to actually the responsibility of the humans. Uh, I'll start with Augusto, then uh, Lisa, then uh, Mina. Thank you. Um, and, and thank you, Karen, for, for bringing up, uh, up the, the sharing thing that is really, really important. Um, but one thing that we are facing at the moment, one problem we are facing with data is the, mon the monopolization of data by big tech com companies. So we don't want to, en to end up in, into a, a division between data owners and data slaves. Data is the, the fuel of AI. So it's, if we don't discuss about data, in t when we discuss about ethics, we are done. And, and, the, and the question that many companies are uh, asking uh, many big techs says, is, uh, is not just how to share or what to share, but is the benefit, are the benefits of AI, or could AI benefit the less powerful groups or not? Because this is, this is the problem, it's about, um, for, I want to give you an example, so I'm not just talking, uh, because your question was about economics. AI is replacing jobs or changing the, the whole d dynamics of jobs. Now, Jobs for, for many people uh, are not just something that we do in exchange of a salary. If we don't, a job is part of our vocation. We are called to work, whether that is part of our DNA. We develop as human beings in jobs. Now, being, uh, uh, given that AI is going to benefit lots of companies, but with less jobs, so who is going to pay the cost? Who is going to pay that cost or, or, that, or what, what economists call the transition? Well, and this is, this, is a, this is a very important because it's not just about the data sharing or how do we share, but it's, well, all this data, the benefit of this data, but that is benefit some and, and not everyone, are those some going to share the cost of the transition while we transit into a different way of understanding jobs and what we do with the, the share time? So one of the goals of this session, which we forgot to say at the beginning, is to open more questions, not to yeah, give the answer. More questions. And I'm glad we are going in that direction. Uh, we have a couple of more minutes, so we can pass the two, two of them as well. I, but I have a follow-up question that what? just came out of the blue to my mind, and I captured two or three concepts. Equally training shared. And uh, coming from a developing country, I wonder what, what is your impression about how the developing world could 
catch up this change because uh, I think Peggy said, how can we make this real? How can we make this real for everyone? So all the humanity really give, captures the benefit. Uh, but sometimes, and, and those coming from developing economies might understand what I say now, the, the urgencies of, of our reality uh, puts these technology things aside and not the focus that should be given to the development. So maybe um, Augusto or, or Sara that come from developing regions. Yeah, so I would like to speak on the area of uh, skills and training, but from the point of view of inclusion. So I just completed a piece of research with the Research ICT Africa, and we're just looking at gender and AI in Africa. So when we took a look at the AI startups in Africa, looking at who is part of the development teams, there was a problem, like you hardly found any women. So we went a step lower and said, okay, let's see, uh, let's look at universities. And for the case of Uganda, I was looking at admission lists of uh, people who are joining computer science, software engineering courses. And you'd find sometimes two women in a class of 40 or 50. So I would like to request that in your skills and capacity building initiatives that you also be inclusive and ensure that all voices are still included all the same. Thank you. One of the good things here is that we actually do have a gender balance at least. Yes. Uh, well, even geographical to some extent. So I'm happy. One of the rare sessions. Yeah. Uh, Augusto, and then we'll get back to Lisa and Mina. Just two quick uh, questions or counter uh, uh, sorry, answers or counter questions. One is, uh, yes, about education, but this is something that, a discussion I have with my mother all the time. Every time we face a problem, he says, oh, the solution is education. Well, yes and no. I mean, the Second World War was initiated by the best educated country in Europe at that time. So the, the, the problem is what kind of education and education for whom? And, we, and in developing countries, as we know, in South America, in Africa, some parts of Asia, well, education is lacking. I mean, basic, when when we are talking about basic education. So we're talking about educating people on AI is too sophisticated. So is, how is AI going to help those people? For example, a, good, a piece of good news is the, the learning of languages through AI in poor countries. That's, this is proving to be good. But it, the question is, what kind of education and how AI is going to help? And the second counter question would be, Developing countries normally, governments are desperate for, well, for, for income to sustain their policies. Now, it is happening already, I wouldn't say which country, but it's happening that some powerful countries come with a, with a planning based on AI to, to less powerful nations and, and say, here they are, this is extraordinary, this is a new, new technology, but, but it's going to allow you to control your citizens, you see, because it's about citizen control. Well, and and of course, governments in the developing nations, they love that. But is this what we are aiming at? I'm glad you didn't mention the country, but, uh, but I, 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 a couple have come to my mind. Uh, we have uh, uh, input from the remote participant, then I'm back to you. Jun. Uh, good, good morning. We have a question from the Johannesburg Remote Hub. What role should big corporates play in ethical handling of data and what is the common or current use of data collected by big corporates? Thank you, June. Um, so in the, in the third part, and, and good morning to, to, uh, to the hub, uh, in the third part we'll move more on to uh, actually who should do what, what are, who should have what responsibilities. We have some reflections over there, tech sector, companies and governance dominating. Uh, we have maybe a couple of more minutes, so I want to take a few quick uh, reflections from you. I promise to Lisa and Mina, and then to, to, uh, to Peggy. Uh, Lisa? <clears throat> sure, I wanted to go back to this conversation about geopolitics and economics. And um, in my experience, both of those, uh, those areas of expertise always come down to someone loses and someone wins. It's a zero-sum game. And I fear that unless we do some smart things now in digital inclusion and in AI, we're going to be in a similar someone loses and someone wins. And 
Um, I don't think it has to be that way. I think we can create an and scenario where people have opportunities. There have been reports about including women and marginalized communities in these conversations. There have been calls for diversity and inclusion from Tunis that established the IGF, from, from secretary generals, other senior officials, and we are still not quite getting there. And it is without, without having that diversity and inclusion, the people from uh, South America, Latin America, those from Africa, around the world, in the room, we are going to create that zero-sum situation. So I think really focusing on and solutions and making sure that everybody has a voice in this is important. And it's gonna take us until 2030 to get there because those are difficult conversations to have about why and the harms and what we can do to come up with those solutions. I think you're optimistic with 2030, but let's hope <laughs> <laughs> with the agenda at least. Uh, Mina. I was going to uh, address the question from, uh, from the commentator, uh, Deborah from Italy, but something really, really quick because um, I thought that, just, just to confirm, I don't think from my perspective and from what I know, that the conversation on ethics and the conversation on human rights are in any way disjointed or in any way at odds at all. Um, I'll, give you, I'll give you, you know, that might be my shameless, you know, mention of the work that we do. But um, the, the IEEE Global Initiative, for instance, uh, the work that we have produced and the standard certifications and creation of the principles that should govern AI, they are based on three pillars. And the very first pillar, the very first pillar is the advancement of human rights as agreed upon by everyone, you know, OHCHR, UN, everyone, right? So that is the very first pillar, that, that AI is not only has to be human-centric, but it has to be built so that it advances the exercise, the free exercise of human rights. Um, and, and two, the second pillar also is also one of the key pillars of human rights as well, which is agency and, and political self-determination. Uh, that was two. Now, the principles are transparency, accountability, trustworthiness, fairness, and so on. Pillars are what, you know, basically is the platform, basically is the basis where we are stemming or we're building these sort of ethical principles. Now, I would be remiss also if I do not mention the UNGPs. Uh, may have been mentioned in conversations yesterday in different contexts. But the ethically aligned design of the IEEE Global Initiative, our policy, com you know, our policy recommendations to governments, the very first part of the recommendations is they are built on the UNGPs, the UN Guiding Principles for Business, on human rights, uh, for business and Human Rights, which is known as the Ruggie Principles. Um, this, is, this is our very first recommendation. We said that you have to look at those UNGPs they have to be the guiding principles for how you should architect, you know, perhaps how you should define the rules of the market, how you should define the rules for capital access, you know, for access of communities that are not on the, you know, on the broadband and the network and so on, how businesses should look at the people they serve, how, you know, that we should try to be more, you know, focus on share, on not shareholder value, but more on stakeholder value and so on and so forth. So these kind of, they are there, they are baked into many, and I'm not going to say it's only the IEEE principles, but I'm pretty sure that partnership on AI, for example, or, you know, the, the principles that have been built by, you know, that have been put together by the high-level expert group of the European Union and, 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 and OECD and so on, all that to say, they are not at odds at all, at all. But, you know, this very short thing that I, would, that I would say is, you know, to achieve that vision of 2030, I think we're going to have to fight like hell. We're going to have to advocate a lot. The principles are great, and we've, we've done an amazing exercise to come up with the principles. But if we were to, because you mentioned, you know, the communities that are underserved, communities that do not have access to technology, I'll point you to the statistic that I think the Secretary General, I think it was him, who quoted yesterday. He said that only 2% of women in South America have phones that have access to broadband. Now, if you are a woman in South, sorry, not South Africa, South America, um, if you are a woman and wanted to build a business and you don't have that access, how are you going to get capital? How are you going to you know, build a team? How are you going to do any of that? Now, if you're not telling me that what you need here is fighting like hell, you know, 
do diplomacy, work with governments, you know, bring people to the table and just, not just cajoling, not just in incentivizing, but really fighting like hell to make it happen. I don't know, hopefully 2030 would be where we're gonna get there. Um, I think the, the important thing that you, that you outlined, which is actually a good introduction to the second part is, that we already have some principles in place. Let's see how we can do that. But closing the discussion on what, I'll just give the, the final uh, part to, to uh, Peggy. Thanks, thanks. No, and it's actually going back to the question that you asked, but fortunately it brings up the, the, the two comments just made on, on inclusion and on the guiding principles. You, you asked a very fundamental question about what's the economic side of this? I mean, we all want it to happen, but if it's not happening, why isn't it happening? And I think it goes to this issue, I, I wouldn't say funding, but it's incentives. What is the incentive that currently exists? And the incentives that currently exist do not actually fully support the concepts of responsible AI that we just talked about. And what we have to do is change that equation so that the companies that do the human rights impact assessments, that do the human rights due diligence behind how they're deploying AI have a competitive advantage because those things actually help them in the marketplace as well. And part of how we need to do that is for governments to actually take aboard the UN guiding principles that place responsibility on them with regards to how they regulate uh, business and for business uh, under the guiding principles to fulfill its responsibility to respect human rights. And we can get into the detail there later, but ultimately we can't have the companies that are actually bringing in human rights and ethical principles in the way that they uh, should be on the back foot um, against those who are charging ahead without regards for these things. Thank you. Uh, well, um, the excellent intro into the second part. Uh, so we are, we are turning from what into how. We'll save, we have two questions over there, so I'll note it. Uh, before I pass the floor to uh, Olga, uh, Natasha, you can probably move to the next uh, Mentimeter. So this, is, this will be the place for any of your comments. Uh, if you're too shy to take the floor or you simply want to share, not a tweet, but a couple of words, you can just post it there and then we'll be getting back to the questions over there. Uh, I guess we can take a minute of silence because there is so much of... One, one thing that is working very well is that um, I, our, our experts are doing also questions. So we have more questions that uh, at the beginning, which is somehow the expected outcome of this of this session, and I, I I want to stress one one sentence from from Peggy: How can we make this real? Um, how can we get this to our governments, to our organisations, and make this real? How can we take this uh, into concrete actions? And the second question is. Are we taking some questions? Uh, oh, you can start the, the second, okay. the, the next part with... And Mentimeter, not yet, okay. Uh, well, uh, so, the second is, what is the role of human rights, legal instruments and ethical frameworks in ensuring trustworthy and responsible data governance and artificial, and artificial intelligence? Uh, are there lessons learned from existing frameworks? Um, can we use the principles, uh, ethics, and human rights that we have now, or we have to revise them, we have to replace them. Um, can they apply to artificial intelligence as we have them today, or do they require some perhaps multi-stakeholder dialogue to up upgrade them or adjust them to the new reality? Um, how the law applies to this uh, unexplainable uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence self-action. Uh, so this is, this is the next uh, group of questions. Um, I don't know, maybe, maybe Peggy, you want to start? Or, uh, I'm I feel bad taking the... on you uh, in relation with how, what's, your, what's your vision about the existing framework of human rights? Does it need a revision? Does, is it, does it apply as it is? Should we uh, create a space to debate again? I, I'm really glad you asked it and asked it in that frank way because it's something I think a lot of, the, a lot of people think is, is some of the questions we're dealing with are so novel and so unpredicted by those who created the, the framework of universal human rights starting in 1948 with the declaration. You know, it's a valid question to say, is this really sufficient for where we need to get? And the answer is yes. I mean, largely it is. 
and to the extent it isn't, we haven't yet gotten to the stage where we even know where those gaps are because we haven't done the hard work of applying the existing framework. Let's do that work first, and then if there are areas where we need further development through doing that work, we'll figure out what those are and we'll, we'll be able to, to take those additional steps. But there's a lot of, you know, there's 70 years of experience of unpacking things like the right to privacy and concepts of human dignity that can be brought in in a very practical and effective way, I think, to answer many of the questions we have regarding artificial intelligence. And the UN Guiding Principles, as we've talked about, is a real starting point for that because it does place responsibility on both states and companies for how they, how they answer these questions. And one of the things we've heard from companies is, we know we're supposed to be applying the guiding principles, but we are a bit uncertain about how to do that in the tech space. And so that's my self-promotional. Um, we have a project that's really working with companies to look at that, to say the UN guiding principles have a long history of being applied in the uh, apparel sector or the extractive industries, but let's really talk about what it means to do human rights due diligence, to do a human rights impact assessment mm -hmm. for a new piece of technology or a new application of technology um, within the world that we now live. And let's talk through how a responsible company behaves in terms of the linkage to harms downline, what does causality mean, what does contribution mean for uh, the questions we're now asking on things like facial recognition. So we're working with companies based on practical scenarios to work through those questions. What we find when we do that is that there are a lot of answers already baked into the existing framework and that that fundamental question of do we need something more you know, at least is something we can wait to get to. So it, it seems that the framework is there and, and, and from your comments, uh, the companies are, are willing to, to, to work with, with you and trying to use those principles in designing the, the technology. Uh, what about governments and other organizations like the Vatican? How, how do governments some companies are implementing and developing the technology, so may, maybe they already have that, that concept being included, like human rights by design, something like that. What about governments and other organizations that are perhaps ruling or, or designing regulations and laws? Maybe Yoishi or Augusto. Uh, thank you, Olga. Um, I would like to follow up the, um, this comment because, yes, the human rights uh, principles or framework is, is a necessary basis, and yes, we are not implementing it fully. Uh, but given that AI is such a novel technology, is, is, we are in new territory. For example, look at what happens with it, how is it, it is influencing the way our incentive to vote and democracy. Well, that, that goes, so it's, it's, a, it's a fine ethical approach that we need. So we need we need some guidelines for that. But the, last week we were discussing, we had a similar discussion at the European Union, and one expert said something, said regulate, and uh, I'm coming from the companies, and maybe Caroline went to, to uh, comment on that. They were saying regulating AI is like regulating the ocean. I mean, it's impossible. Yeah, but you, what we can be regulated or, or, or is the incentives, the benefits, the design, etc. And something that we are working on is about the, why are we, are we insisted on the data? Because AI is designed and based on data. Now all the data is about the past. And the past brings with us all our problems, our weaknesses, our bias. I mean, look at Silicon Valley, 80% of the designers are male, white people. So uh, are we expecting them to bring this non-biased thing on women? Well, certainly not. But I can, I can talk about other biases as well. So how are we going to bring, to look at the future, not just at the, at, at the past? So, so the, 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 the artificial intelligence is built on data that we have in the past. But we need to think, given that most of our, our, my colleagues agree that we have to be human-centered, what does it mean to be human in a collective environment or organism? Everybody's using the word ecosystem in technology now, and we are, in the Vatican, we laugh about that, because ecosystem is about life, it's our natural life. What does it mean to be humans in a natural life, in a collective world, 
with conflicting values. So how can we, how can we, the human rights is immensely helpful because at least we have already agreed on that. But how can we find some, a couple of more ethical principles that can guide us in towards an inclusive, an inclusive society uh, and towards justice and towards the uh, countering the imbalance of power. This is what we are facing us. So the data from the past looking for the future and the imbalance of power. Those who are developing artificial intelligence, they have a lot of power. How are we going to ensure that that power is used for the benefit of all society and not to increase their own power? Yoishi, perhaps have some governmental perspective from your side? Uh, yeah, thank you very much. Yes, uh, my feeling is uh, when we started the discussion uh, uh, on uh, artificial intelligence, uh, we recognized uh, the very huge potential uh, of the uh, impact uh, brought uh, about by artificial intelligence uh, to the society and the economy, which is not limited to one country, but to the whole uh, whole world. So, uh, uh, what we believed in was, you know, we need to to make the best use of that benefit or uh, that impact from the technology, and uh, we needed to 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 look at the positive side. So, the uh, uh, real intention uh, of the discussion was to maximize the benefit from artificial intelligence and not to regulate the development of the technology. So uh, we wanted to, uh, first uh, we started the discussion at the governmental forum called the G7 because it was something in front of us. And we started the discussion among uh, the uh, kind of closest group of uh, countries, but uh, 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 even at that time, we paid uh, uh, a lot of attention to listening, uh, to listen to the uh, private sector or civil society and multi-stakeholders. So uh, we always had a chance to communicate with multi-stakeholders and uh, uh, get their opinions involved in our discussion. And uh, after we started the discussion at G7, we expanded the, uh, the participants uh, from the countries and uh, industries and academias, uh, civil societies uh, joining to the discussion. And we also uh, brought the discussion to the uh, OECD or G20 uh, to cover more uh, broader coverage, uh, uh, geographical uh, coverage. So, uh, from that point of view, I think the, for example, UN or IGF is uh, one of the ideal uh, fora uh, to discuss uh, that kind of uh, new technology to, to extract the best benefit uh, through the multi-stakeholder discussion. So that's what, my, uh, what I feel at this moment. Olga, I suggest we, we get back to the, to the people there. Uh, we had two, three we have several inputs, so I will first give it to, to uh, the floor to the gentleman there, and then the lady, and then the gentleman here, and we'll see in, in the back. And we have a remote as well, right, uh, Jun? Okay. So, uh, and please introduce yourself. Uh, hello, everybody. Thank you very much. I'm uh, Amir Mokhabri from Tehran University. Uh, first of all, uh, I should thank you for organizing this important and uh, valuable discussion. Uh, I think that uh, we need to establish uh, a special norm package on uh, social responsibility of AI company. Uh, we can call it a CSR for AI, a global CSR framework for AI company. Uh, I strongly believe uh, IGF community can play a vital role in this regard. Uh, also, we need some CBM confidence building measure uh, from the company in this regard. Uh, I think a multi-stakeholder approach can help us in this regard. Uh, we need uh, a global norms on on a responsible behavior of AI company 
and my suggestion is uh, it could be in the Poland IGF agenda. Thank you. Thank you. It's, a, it's an interesting recontextualization of the norms in CBMs into the AI and, and the relations across us rather than the countries. Uh, we had the comment there, then we will go to the uh, remote. Thank you very much. Thank you to the moderators and the panelists for this very provocative and substantial discussion. My name is Maricela Munoz. I am a governmental representative from Costa Rica. I'm also a MAC member. And actually, my question comes from my field of work. I am part of the group of governmental experts for emerging technologies in the field of lethal autonomous weapon systems. So this discussion and dialogue in regard to the application of current human rights framework, and I would include IHL framework as well, is really relevant. And in that regard, I concur with uh, Ms. Hicks that we have a very rich uh, human rights framework that is lacking full compliance, not only on the part of uh, the industry and, and private sector, but I would say uh, a broader multi-stakeholder segment. Uh, we have been experiencing this lack of compliance. So my question is, in terms of the development of technology that will potentially decide upon life and death uh, as it regards to targeting and engaging uh, human beings, uh, fully autonomous decision making from fully autonomous, uh, lethal autonomous weapon systems, I wonder if we must consider that there is certainly a gap that we need to address. The International Committee of the Red Cross has highlighted that they feel there is a gap in IHL that needs to be considered in this regard. So just adding to the bunch of questions that we have been uh, um, elaborating on this morning. Thank you. Thank you, and I think, uh, first of all, for mentioning the, the uh, uh, DG on, on, on laws, because I think that's, again, how do we connect all these dots? And then secondly, I'm sure, Peggy, you can reflect also on the, on the UN high-level panel on digital cooperation, which had some of the recommendations on that. I suggest we take two more. One is the remote, and the other one is the gentleman there. And then, uh, okay, we, you also raised a hand earlier, but just be, be um, short and sweet, uh, June. Uh, uh, sorry, this one's really long. It's coming from Munich. Um, <laughs> there's a gap in the current policy development processes, especially when it comes to defining red lines. For instance, the final draft version of the EU Commission's new guidelines for the ethical use of AI, which should be a kind of ethics handbook with clear red lines and values that are not negotiable for people in politics, business, and software departments is lacking non-negotiable ethical principles. The guidelines have been developed by 52 experts, of whom 23 come from the industry. If you include the lobbying associations, there are 26 representatives from industry, half the group. On the other hand, there were only four experts in ethics and 10 organizations related to consumer protection and civil rights. Would it be helpful if the AGF develops also a responsibility mm. AI framework, including a recommendation, requirements for governance about the multi-stakeholder constitution, in order to ensure industry and public interests are being balanced? Yoichi, again, we are back to the IGF issue huh, and the role of the IGF. We'll get back to that. Okay, maybe two, because the uh, gentleman there asked, and then here, and then we close it for now. Thank you. I will keep it short. My name is Neil Kashwaha. I'm from Canada, uh, private sector. Uh, my question is to the panel, how do we intend to make companies, um, basically the ones that hold the funding, the ones that drive, uh, that have a drive to increase shareholder value, and the ones already confused with various domestic and international law compliances, uh, accountable to uphold ethics, human dignity and rights, and, and UNGP. Accountability of the private sector, thanks. Thank you very much. My name is Kamath. I'm coming from India. I have a two concrete questions for the representatives of the United Nations. Number one, 
that in India, mostly the representatives of the government is always being invited and inform informed about the development of the human rights. But the non-governmental or individuals have no chance, no right, no informations. In 19, uh, uh, 2012, 2013, 2015, I myself written a letter to the Human Rights uh, Association of the United Nations. They gave me no reply. Number two, I requested them to inform me the right person with whom one can get in contact with, thereby the Indian organizations or Indian groups can individually write or present their problems before the human rights problems. The very important issue about the physically handicapped persons in India is practically zero. Mm. And there is no representation from the United Nations persons or from the Indian government side. And in this question, the human right, when we are talking about, and human right we are discussing about, is zero for India and doesn't help the Indian people who are normal people and physically handicapped people. I request you to give us a concrete place where we can get in touch with the subject and get more information and entry to the United Nations discussion panels. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. I think this is a very, very important question. What is the phone number to, to pick or, you know, or the email to send? One, one yeah. comment we'll back to you. very interesting is that this, the spaces where these rules or norms are debated or elaborated do have a bias. It seems that from some comments from colleagues from remote and in, in, the, in the room, so maybe some reflections from, from our experts about that who would like to <laughs> take the floor. I'd be happy to start. For those of you who don't know about the partnership on AI, we are, we have a hundred partner organizations that are focused on benefiting people in society. Sixty of our organizations come from civil society and nonprofit organizations. The other 40 are equally split between industry and academic organizations. We get together in a multi-stakeholder arrangement to address some of the many issues we've talked about today. And one of the ones that I think is vitally important uh, is the word transparency. To me, it underscores trustworthiness. The more transparent our companies, our organizations, our academic institutions are about the ways that they're developing, building, and operating these technologies, the greater understanding users will have to be able to apply their values to, is this the type of system I want to commit to? Um, and it's also a great way for tool builders to hold each other accountable. One of our projects on transparency is a called About ML. And this is a multi-year process. It has been open for public comment and will be open for public comment again. But essentially, we are taking the initiatives of Google, IBM, and Microsoft to label the data that is used to train models and the data that is available out there so that when people are thinking about using a model, they can take a look at it, much like a nutritional label, and say, ooh, this has the information in it that's necessary for me to do what I want to do with this model, or ooh, this does not have the right set of data included, it's not the right one, if I use this, I could perpetuate bias. And what we're finding is a lot of enthusiasm for these organizations to work together to be more transparent in this place. But along the way, we have our civil society and academic organizations that are enthusiastically um, backing this and pushing all of the organizations, all of the partner organizations in PAI to adopt these types of transparency measures and otherwise so that it does start to hold each other accountable. There are people within these organizations who are individual champions who are really pushing this and um, we, are, we are also very focused on making sure that the people do implement this in the future as well. 
Um, thank you very much. I wanted to come back to your earlier question about the UN Declaration on Human Rights and following up on Peggy's comments. Um, you know, for us, no, you don't, there is no need for a new framework. That framework is universal. It's timeless, um, what we call timeless values. But the question then is how do you translate that framework into something that is actionable for all of the actors in the AI ecosystem? I'm sorry, I'm going to come back to that term. And that doesn't it mean just, you know, I, it feels like a lot of you are focused on the big tech companies. It's not just the big tech companies. It's the small and medium-sized organizations around the world. It's the entrepreneurial startups that will drive the economic value, that will drive the growth and the sustainable development. It's all the actors in the ecosystem. How do you translate from that high-level values into something that is implementable? And so from that perspective, which is why when we started to look at this, an organization like Partnership on AI, which we had um, a role in, in co-founding, the notion is it has to be a multi-stakeholder conversation to identify what are the priority issues that need to be addressed in order to enable this technology to achieve the, the, the potential. How do you make it trustworthy? It comes back to that. What are the tools that are necessary? The about ML work, I think, is um, essential in order to bring the conversation to the next stage. Uh, the inclusiveness, the multi-stakeholderism, then the accountability mechanism. These mechanisms are going to be different depending on the context in which this technology is being um, addressed. So what we hope is that as we go from the high-level frameworks, which does it, which includes civil, political, economic, social, you know, et cetera, into that framework, into what we should do, the le there will be lessons learned in the different sectors, in the different ways in which the technology is being implemented around the world. And another thing is we need to understand, and going back to Sarah's question, we need to be able to understand where are the issues? What are the mechanisms? Until you understand what the problem is, it's really hard to identify what are the solutions. Um, going back to a comment that says um, around, you know, does the IGF need to build a, a social compact? Do we need another social compact? The OECD principles for steward of trustworthy AI has now been adopted by OECD and non-member, non-OECD countries in the May timeframe, that was 42 countries. In the June timeframe, it was adopted by the G20. So part of the question here is, is it, it, you know, would our time be better spent and would we be able to work together better if we can really get to the point where we work together to establish shared practices to potentially give input back to about ML as one initiative? How can we share in the implementation and really make progress, move the needle forward? Uh, Mina? Oh. Augusto first, okay. And, um, sort of picking up uh, on, on a, a comment on uh, Neil from Canada about that is related to what Caroline said, how can we help companies to translate this ethical or human rights framework into, into actions, into concrete values? Um, well, that, that's, a, that's an important question that needs dialogue, and, and I don't have the solution, but what we are uh, discussing with some companies uh, and listening to lots of civil society people involved and human, is that AI is like kind of whether we like it or not is the mirror of society at the moment so it could be a black mirror as this serious a, a dark mirror or it could be a bright one or maybe mixed because we humans are we have dark sides and we have bright sides but it's a mirror and, and that's why we have a lot of bias, we have a lot of injustice, we have a lot of uh, terrible things inside, but we have also enormous good things. But it's the mirror. So uh, one of the things that is mirroring at the moment is the measurement of success. So the measurement of success in terms of technology cannot be limited to a utility piecemeal. So why not? Because we are measuring the advancement, advancement of technology from its productivity or utility value, just from a technical side, ignoring if this is helping human advancement or human development or well-being. 
So that's why my comment is we need to match that. And to match, we need to evaluate if the utility value, which is transforming economics, is extended to more to other dimensions of humanity, which is which are not limited to economics utility. So and this is why when people say we need to bring ethical principles, well, utilitarianism is a very sophisticated ethical uh, not just principle, but an entire ethical framework, but, but it's quite limited. So we need to bring on board other ethical principles and expand the notion of success and, 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 uh, on, on, on AI that goes beyond the, the technical and economic productivity. Uh, and also, uh, how, can we, how can we bring um, this, this evaluation into what somebody said, uh, uh, capabilities or human cohesion or, collect, or collective, you know, so what is the added value of AI? So we have, one point is to, to, to move from shareholder values, as Neo was saying, to stakeholders. But stakeholders, I mean, AI is difficult because there are so many people involved. So that's why it's so important the participation of civil society, because otherwise we, we, we are developing something that is good for you, but we are not listening to you. Well, that, that's not, so how can we transform or, or how can we move, we journey together from this technical utility piecemeal into a, another, this is something that we need to work alongside uh, different companies, alongside civil society, alongside governments. But some companies have more responsibility than others because they have, some, they have more power to do this, they have more money to invest on this analysis than others. Uh, yes, please. Uh. Yeah, so I just wanted to give an example which is on the plus side of uh, uh, work from Joy Buloa, Mini, I can't pronounce her name, from the MIT Media Lab who tested uh, facial recognition software from Microsoft, IBM, Face++, Amazon, Google, etc. And she really pushed for it and said, how can you have software that identifies someone like Michelle Obama as male? Like, come on. So many people around the world know who Michelle Obama is. But when she reached out to Microsoft and IBM, they actually replicated the data and tested it. And when they discovered that it was uh, faulty, they, they fixed the problem. So at least it's good that the companies are willing to listen. And I hope we continue to collaborate. Mina, yes. I'll, I'll say something quick. And, and probably I'll try to pick on what Peggy has said about the existence of the tools that we have. And, and, I'm, and I fully agree. And, so, and, and there are many cases where, if we bring the argument to the legal space, for example, the laws that we have. In the United States, for example, so to your point that you have mentioned, and, 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 and you know, correct me if I didn't get that right, but your point was we have principles what we, where we fall short is exercising those principles, right? Exercising the human rights. We have understanding of how to do that. The problem is we haven't gotten to the point where everyone you know, is, is exercising those, you know, human rights freely. Now, in the U.S., for example, from the legal perspective, um, we've had laws for, for decades and for a century or more on, you know, um, against discrimination, for example, right? And discrimination in many cases, in housing, discrimination in, in lending, discrimination equal opportunity and employment, and so on. And these, you know, we can arguably say that they can fall under the, you know, the very basic definition and the notions of human rights. But until today, so we have, for example, something called, you know, TILA, which is Truth in Lending Act. It says that you have to be transparent, you have to be accountable, and you have to tell how you made your determination on why you decided that that person, who might be from a protected class or, a, you know, a minority, why they did not, you know, get the loan that they have applied for. You have other rules, you know, on, on non-discrimination and housing. But until today, and that is very recent, that happened this year, Facebook, for example, was involved in cases of showing housing ads and, you know, was, you know they, they, were, they were, you know, discriminating against, you know, who was showing the housing ads or who was shown or to whom it was shown the housing ads. So if you were you know, um, an African American, you didn't get the housing ads in certain zip code. If you were you know, white, you know, it, was, it was different. Um, now, and this is to the point that Father Augusto has actually made about the data, that the data actually convey realities and notions and preconceived conceptions and a lot of historical artifacts 
of our society. So the information, for example, that we get, and this is a case that is always discussed in conversations around bias, and that's something that Joy would have mentioned, for instance, and many others. They talk about the cases of the use of automated decision-making systems in making determinations on criminal recidivism. Criminal recidivism is your probability as an inmate to go to prison. You're trying to optimize the sentence of a person so that you, know, you want to make sure that they go to prison for X amount of years, that the likelihood they will not go back to crime, you're trying to minimize that basically. So you, know, so you maximize the prison term so that you make sure that they have been you know, rehabilitated and they can go back to society and become you know, a normal you know, person who is contributing and so on. Now the problem with that is, and, and this is a technicality in the law, you know, because of the countries that use common law, for example, that needs precedent to be developed, but that's kind of a, I will digress and that will be a different conversation. So I will skip that point. But the point was that in that case, criminal recidivism in the US, in Wisconsin, an African American, you know, was subject of a determination by that system, which was called Compass. Compass was using data that were proxy variables that were not you know, good, that, that would, not, would not have been able to make good determination on whether that person would, should go to prison for X amount of terms or you know, didn't make a good determination on the recidivism of that person. And that person ended up, by comparison, because they were African American, you know, go to prison for you know, a harsher term or so. And so the idea is that the data that was pulled by, this, you know, by, the, by the tool, Compass, we're really indicative of a lot of endemic and historic artifacts and structure of society that said, well, African Americans, because they live here, you know, we are associating just bad variables, right? So, you know, your zip code is kind of, zip code cannot be, um, um, you know, an indicator for how many years, you know, you should be in prison, for example. That was kind of the fault of, of Compass. But this information was based on a lot of historical you know, incidents and, and in, in, in the US, for example, redlining and discrimination and housing and all of that. And today we see the output of it. So if you use this data not knowing the historical context, you will for sure not do anything but to make that discrimination live in perpetuity unless you know the context, unless you know how you can go and take these principles and really try to exercise them. And that's the part about the advocacy. That's what Sarah said about you know, the work of, you know, someone like Joy and so many other people, ACLU, people who prosecuted cases and so on, we have to continue doing that, so. Yes, please go ahead. Thanks, I, I just wanted to pick up, I, I think, as you've just heard, I mean, there are multiple examples of where we're not living up to the ethical and human rights standards with regards to how AI is, is being deployed and used, the algorithms, themselves and the, the data that it draws from, uh, as, as has been said, can bring in bias, are non-transparent, are not accountable in a variety of ways. And, and I guess the question then is, is it that, you know, the, the, that ethical and, and human rights framework isn't sufficient? You know, I've argued that, no, I, I don't think that's a problem. But there is a problem. And the problem is that the process and the mechanisms for applying and implementing that ethical guidance and that legal human rights framework is insufficient. And that's what we have to address. And then we get into this whole question of, you know, how much of that is going to be binding, how much of it's going to be advisory, how much of it is multilateral, how much of it has to be ha happening at the country level, how much of it has to be happening at the company level. And we've had a lot of in-depth conversations on that, and the answer is we need more at all of those levels, as far as I can tell. Um, we don't want to duplicate systems that are in place. We need to build on what's there, but we need to make it more effective. And that's where you get the high-level panel on digital cooperation report, um, recommendations regarding IGF+, plus, you know, how that could be helpful. Um, it's about the fact that uh, at a national level, um, we're starting to see greater development of national um, advisory offices on AI and what is the model for doing that and how would that work best and what are the good practices and how do we scale that up so that every country has the ability to make uh, regulation and to look at how AI is being deployed in a way that will allow them to, to apply the human rights and ethical framework more effectively. And then, of course, as we talked about, how we bring that to the company level as well. And ultimately, you know, our position is we do need both a way to, to move towards that national level uh, 
at least advisory institution that can issue opinions on how we have accountability for AI, for example, and, and, and looking at, at some of the tough issues around deployment of AI, and especially in government use of AI, looking at uh, the way it's being used in healthcare systems and employment and, and other things. Um, and then what do we need at that multilateral level? Well, we do need to have something that will help us ensure that we're developing that in a way that's equitable. That doesn't just mean that we have that level of implementation and advice in, in you know, developed Western countries, but we don't have similar levels of expertise and ability being brought into the same conversations that are happening in countries that may not have the same level of resources. And that's where, of course, IGF can help. Um, ideas like uh, centers of expertise in the global partnership for AI and the partnership on AI as well, all of those pieces can come together to help inform those conversations. And I think this was, this was a perfect uh, sort of wrapping up of the question of how. Well, not really wrapping up, it's opening more questions. But there are some, some very useful uh, suggestions. Time to move to the third question, which is about who. But before that, I wanted to uh, firstly apologize to all of you that we might have not reflected on all the questions over there, but I'm glad you, you had a chance also to see them. And uh, you will probably have the chance to see some of them, quite, quite some interesting ones. This, this is one I like. Treat AI like humans, require education, and hold their parents accountable. So there are quite, quite some interesting uh, uh, food for thought there. Uh, some of them we will also um, input into, the, into this last uh, part of the discussion. Uh, Natasha, you can probably uh, bring back the previous slide with the, with the graph. Um, so, uh, and, and on a question which was also raised there, who, who is the eight expert? The eight expert is actually the AI who is listening, or it is listening the whole discussion, and will close the session with a statement. So, but bear with us. Um, moving to the third question. Um, how to cross the bridge between defining human rights and ethical frameworks and implementing them in AI systems and SDGs, which is partly what we already covered, but then what is the role of different stakeholders and how can they work together to achieve best results? So the role of particular stakeholders, actually who? And I wanted to, to go back to this, um, <clears throat> which is quite an indicative uh, reflection from the, from the room today, the, room, the temperature of the room. Uh, tech sector, well, the, the top responsibles are companies and governments. Second one is tech sector. And then it's, it's quite interesting, the users are, are down there, but we'll get back to that. Before I passing back the floor to you, I wanted to check if there is anyone fr from the floor who voted and who wants to um, explain why you voted very high on the uh, role of the tech sector. Does anyone want to reflect within a tweet why you think the tech sector role is, is high? Otherwise, I'll, I'll tease Mina to do that, but... I think everyone holds the tech sector res responsible because they have the closest technical touch, the most intimate knowledge of how these um, algorithms actually work, how they actually operate, and kind of what the operational limitations are that they could or should be uh, communicating. Thank you. Um, Mila, this, is, this definitely goes first to you, I'll get back. Uh, yesterday when we discussed, you said, well, the role of the engineers, no, I'm paraphrasing, the role of the engineers is actually to optimize the, 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 the solutions, but the data is actually what brings the, the whole discussion about the responsibility and so on. And there was a question from last year, if you remember, uh, should there be or is there an ethical um, oath, an ethical code, like a Hippocrates oath for engineers, a Tesla oath for engineers, uh, like the ethical guidance? Back to you. Uh, we probably, and, and by the way, just, just, just to be very clear, Greg is with IEEE, so he already answered for ah, me. So that was, that was, that was intentional. Are, <laughs> that was intentional because he wanted to, you know, save me the embarrassment of not knowing how to answer if we should have a Tesla, you know, oath. Um, I, 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 don't know, I don't know if I can answer that specific question, if we should have an oath. Um, the, it's, it's, we probably should, and I mean, there are obviously a lot of code of ethics, for example, that are, you know, that inform the work of engineers. Uh, but the, the problem usually is that, or I think the lack of the, of the issue, or the lack of, the lack of the, or the issue is the lack of understanding of how technology impacts society in general from a technical perspective, from, you know, from an engineer's perspective, that's something that is not quite discussed very much. You know, so that's something that 
you know, psychologists and, 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 and people who understand, you know, who study society and understand, you know, the, the role of, you know, religion and norms and, and values and so on have been studying that for a long time. But that's something that in my training as an engineer, haven't been on the curriculum at all, mm. right? Um, and so I don't know if that's a good answer to the question that you, that, you know, that you were hoping to get to or not, but there's absolutely a role for something, you know, to have that to have that understanding. Now, I'll, I'll try to also answer the question as well that you were asking about, well, who and how, and you know, we kind of covered the, the how question already, but you know, it a, a little bit. But um, I think that you know, in defining the rules, and that's probably also my shameless you know, plug into, into the work of the IEEE here, is that in, the tech, in, in creating technology, technologies are informed and they are run by standards. And that is kind of something that the IEEE Global Initiative does. The IEEE Standards Association is the second largest standards organization in the world. We define standards for technologies development and deployment and use and so on. And in the series of, you know, and, and the standards that we're developing right now are beyond just technical requirements. They are focused on due diligence and applications of compliance and, you know, certifying accountability and transparency, going through, you know, very holistic, very, very descriptive and prescriptive, you know, uh, uh, flow of what did you check to make sure that the due diligence has been taken into account and so on. There's also another mention that I'll probably throw in, in there too, that, uh, Maybe I'll skip that mention, but I think I've, I've said that on a panel yesterday when we were sitting. We were asked a similar question, which is, well, what is the next step from, you know, the principles and the frameworks and so on? The implementation, as Peggy, you know, very eloquently said, that's the more difficult question, right? It's, it's, it's very, very difficult to find the answer, then the answer is always yes on all levels. Companies have to be involved. Governments have to be involved. You know, civil society have to be involved. Um, I think in my call, the very short answer I gave yesterday was, it's time that we create regulatory you know, uh, sandboxes and technology sandboxes. We have to try out. We have to get into the dirt, you know, roll up your sleeve, basically, define problems, define you know, um, solutions, work out solutions with you know, defined scope, limited scope, and then see how they work, right? Uh, we just have to try out how we can write those sort of regulatory instruments but in a, in a sandbox. So who should do that? So the question for the others, the role of the engineers. We'll focus back on the others as well. The role of the engineers. Lisa. I actually think there are three different groups that are relevant here. Um, leadership, journalists, and the people that are putting funding into the system. And I missed your conversation yesterday about funding and, and funders and everything else. But let me talk about the leadership of, of the companies that are making this. There are some that are out there that are advocating for responsible and ethical uses of AI and development of it. Um, there are some that are committing to diversity and inclusion. There are some who have um, offices around the world. If they do not lead by example and follow through with those calls with legitimate results, it, it's picked up by everyone around the world, but especially those who work for them. Leading by example is so very important, and actually making that happen is extraordinarily important. Mm -hmm. Shameless plug here, I am so excited. The partnership on AI is actually two-thirds female. I am. Um, That's not the gender never, balance. I've never, <laughs> I've never worked in an organization. I've never worked in an organization like that before, and as diverse as it is, because the executive director at the top has emphasized that as an important example, and it's flowed downward in our work. Journalists. There are some amazing journalists out there covering artificial intelligence, but some of the questions that I would love to hear them say is, who was not involved in the creation of this report, or who was not involved in this study? And if they weren't involved, how would the study look differently because they weren't involved? So I think there are some important questions that journalists can take to help hold all of us accountable in this space and make us do a better job of committing to things like responsible and uh, trustworthy artificial intelligence, diversity and inclusion. Um, ProPublica actually did an, an extraordinary report on Compass, this tool 
that he referred to about recidivism, and it started a great look into the role of those algorithmic tools. And then finally, I'd like to talk about the funders. Carolyn mentioned earlier the small and medium-sized enterprises, and I thoroughly agree that that's where the innovation is coming from. But I think the timelines that funders are expecting as a result, the, the profits that they want to get and the timelines are inc incongruous with what thought is required to implement responsible and trustworthy AI, res uh, implement human rights angles, implement ethical approaches into the development of technology. And so looking at that more closely, I think, is an important piece of work that many of us could take a look at. Let me build up on what you mentioned on the uh, journalists and funders. Um, actually, what, what we had the discussion yesterday started with a question on the users. The users, is not rate, they are not rated, all of us, we are not rated much high over there. And, uh, and when we discussed, okay, we may blame the companies because the, or, or the economic pressure, commercial pressure, and so on. Uh, the companies set the standards, there's a lot of marketing over there, that's fine. But the users are the ones which are actually creating the demand based on uh, that, or lack of awareness, lack of education, whatever. So we came up to what is the responsibility of us, all of us as a community, as users, uh, and what are the ways to change the demand so that we demand as users not the brighter, the sh shiniest new products, but actually something that's responsible, right? And then we came to the question. So we got to the conclusion, sort of an internal, but that's a food for thought, that probably the uh, civil sector, the uh, civil society organizations, the academia can do more in awareness, in training, in, in research. But the question came, who funds that? And then not just what you mentioned, and journalists as well. So who funds that? And what is the bias of the funding? Right? So I, actually, I wanted to, to pass it to Sarah, because you come from a, a sort of a, yeah, the NGO sector to some extent. Um, how do you cope with the research awareness and funding? And how do you see these this risks of funding and, and an ability to change the user demand? So <laughs> I just want to start by saying that we are here discussing this now. That means there's a problem and we need to sort it. But also, as civil society or as people who advocate, we should stop just rolling eyes. OK, LinkedIn has shown my mail, like someone I went to school with, a more managerial position than me, rolls eyes, moves on. Like, we should stop just rolling eyes and start to act. And that's why I gave the example of joy, like trying to advocate and really, really push these companies. And I understand that sometimes the funding is like tilted to what the companies want, but sometimes you can find a way to also, you know, fix in your agenda and tell them that, okay, we understand you're giving us money, but these are the really pressing issues that we are seeing from our community. And if, if you respond, probably yeah, it will be a good thing. Yeah. No, but that's important. Yeah. Uh, Olga, you wanted to? Uh, no, I was just taking some notes for the final reflection. The closing. Yeah. Yeah, any other reactions on that? Yeah, uh, Caroline. I just wanted to uh, pick up the point about the, the both the funding um, and sort of the, the mechanisms and, and give a shout out to a, a report that actually I think just went live this morning by Element AI of a workshop that they did on human rights-based governance of AI that really picks up both of those points about how there has to be uh, more built into funding and incentives uh, for the, the types of actions that we've talked about today. And, and, and to just take one other look at the, that tech sector level that, that's on the chart, um, one of the things that we've talked about and the best example of this is how, of course, so much is placed on the companies and on the government, but that industry-wide approach and what we're expecting from across companies is equally important. And the, the example that comes up is about the online content moderation. I mean, it doesn't work for every company to be able to define on its own what hate speech is and how it's going to take it down. Um, it, you know, that's not a sustainable model. It's not a transparent model. It's not a model that we're comfortable with. Now, I prefer, obviously, we find a way to bring human rights law in and we do this in a, in a, a multilateral or at least national 
way, but at a minimum what we need is for the companies to come together and start at least comparing notes on how they're doing it so that we can have some sort of coherence and consistency um, that, that does make them more accountable for what's happening. And that's a proposal, for example, from the Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Expression for something like a social media council that the companies would themselves pull together and would uh, allow themselves to be held accountable to as well. If, if they define those standards together and then apply them together, it would give a, a added level of both transparency and accountability to what's happening online. Uh, Karen? Uh, um, yes, I um, want to address a, a couple of things. Going back to, you know, hey, is this just a responsibility of the engineer? And combining that with a comment from Lisa with respect to this being a top-down, uh, this needs to be a top-down priority. It's both top-down and bottoms up. And it's not just the engineer's uh, responsibility. It is everyone's uh, responsibility at the table. One of the things that very early on we identified as being extremely critical in the development of these kinds of systems is the fact that it's not just multi-stakeholder, uh, multi but it's also multidisciplinary. So let me give you an example. Very early on, one of our researchers uh, did a project to look at what, if you were, um, had gone to the hospital with pneumonia, what kind of people should get treatment. And it turns out from the data set that people who had asthma could be released and you know, were not under uh, you know, uh, didn't have to be treated urgently, and that's completely against intuition or any medical knowledge. And it was a doctor who was at the table who said, wait, this didn't make any sense, because the data show that if you were admitted to the hospital with pneumonia and you had asthma, you were given special treatment, right? So that's a very, very simple example that says it's not just the engineers and the data scientists, it's also the subject matter experts, it's also the sociologists. So for example, if you're going to deploy a system out there, what's the social environment and how's the culture different if a system was going to be implemented in China versus in the U.S. because the social environment is very, very different. Mm. And this goes back to the point that you made very early on, which is ethics is a social cultural construct and it is context dependent. It's not up to the engineer to say, you know, this is ethical or this is fair. It's entirely contextual. Back to the point of fairness, several people have brought on the notion, so if, let's say if you do a search, a, a, a very commonly cited example, if you do a search on CEO, the data will come back showing, let's say, 80% male and 20% female. Well, if as a search company, we finagle that to be fair by the Western standard, are we manipulating content in a particular way according to our ideals, or is it better to reflect the reality of the data? I don't know the answer to that. And I think this is a conversation where we really need everyone at the table. And I think this is a conversation that we can have here at the IGF. It goes down to that level of detail so that we're not speaking in terms of generality, but let's say, what, how should the principle be applied if it's AI is being used for um, diagnostics in terms of uh, diseases, if the data is being used to address challenges that women are facing around the world, we really need to take the conversation down to that level. I think you raised a very interesting comment about the multidisciplinary complex of this issue. I think this happens also in internet governance. I'm an engineer, but you have to learn about social issues, international aspects, uh, laws, regulations, and it's not easy. You're, you're trained in a very specific uh, um, subject, and then you have to learn other things, but we, we select the career that we mm -hmm. feel more comfortable with. It's just, it's just imagine how hard it's going to be to the AI for the AI to capture all of that knowledge. Exactly. So th this is a very interesting uh, reflection. Augusto, uh, we, we should wrap up the, this yes. part of the discussion, Augusto, and then we move on. Yes, no, just talking about interdisciplinary. I'm, I'm not an expert in AI. I'm, I'm an ethicist, so I'm a theological ethicist. And there are some principles about responsibility, <laughs> that was your question, that most traditions, most ethical traditions, religious traditions agree. So the more resources, so the more power you have, the more responsible you are. This is a basic ethical principle everybody can understand. And even in your family, if you don't understand it, try to think about your family. 
Uh, so yes, we need a conversation with all the stakeholders involved because this affects everyone, yes. Uh, but it's like climate change. Yes, I mean, well, climate change is a negative thing, not necessarily AI, but yes, we need on the table everybody who uh, to, to sort out this problem, but the ones who pollute more have more responsibility. As simple as that. Yeah, yes, we need a conversation about everybody in AI, but the ones who benefit more from the AI have more responsibility. Now, having more responsibility is not a bad thing. And one thing that it was very interesting, um, what was said about journalists, because I, I didn't think about that. One thing that we can do media-wise is to distinguish also companies. There are some companies that are more responsible than others in AI. There are some companies that are investing lots and lots of um, fundings and millions and billions of dollars, such as yours, in trying to connect at least the technical issue with the ethical issue and address the problem interdisciplinary, and the others who can care less. Mm -hmm. So this is something that probably we have to make accountable, the companies for that, I mean, we civil society or religions, because we have to distinguish the, the ones who are going, trying to put AI in the right direction and those who are not. But the, the principle of responsibility is, it remains, and, and, you, and we cannot hold accountable poor people in Africa or in Latin America because, because what they consume, because what they consume is already informed by, by AI. Yes, they have a, some responsibility, but till we have, till we, we, we have a system of education, we are aware, well, those who are benefiting right now from that are more responsible. We have some questions from remote, and I think maybe... Yeah, yeah and then we the can audience? wrap up. So the, the final, yeah. Hi, this question is from Yola Ann. It's a Nigerian hub. Um, they are saying the development of the internet infrastructure completely ignored rural communities at inception. That is why we are having to come back to include them via initiatives like the community networks. In this infancy of AI development, how are we considering the integration of the rural communities so we do not make the same mistake done with the internet infrastructures. Thank you, and we have uh, one comment here. Yes, um, thank you. Um, my name is Emil. I work at the Danish Institute for Human Rights. Um, we worked a lot on human rights impact assessments in the past and are currently having a project looking at the digital and human rights impact assessments. So, so of course, I agree with um, Peggy and the others who have said that, um, yes, human rights are definitely capable of de dealing with these issues, but that maybe more guidance is needed. Um, and I, there's a lot of food for thought today for me, but one minor question that I would like to ask to the panelists is, as part of a human rights-based approach, rights holder engagement to get to the impact that is significant or essential. But um, we've talked about a lot of actors that should be involved, but do you have thoughts of how do you actually engage with rights holders or whether it be proxies um, in relation to developing responsible AI? We've talked about a lot of different groups that should be involved, but how about the rights holders? Thank you. We have to wrap up, but if anyone, one person wants to get, to get on this one, or we keep it open for, for, the, for the next round of discussions. This is just the first two hours of this session, then we continue for the next three hours. No, I'm kidding, but, but I mean, we would need at least three, three more hours. I warned you at the beginning that we have an AI which is actually listening all that we are talking, and so we, I don't know to, to what extent we were responsible in what we were talking about and what AI is going to learn, but I, I do welcome uh, Kualo. So Kualo is the former coffee maker. Uh, currently, it's a future, well, it's future AI expert. Uh, it works with the Humanity Project, the project which connects AI and humanity. Uh, it has a session, by the way, at uh, 1.50 this afternoon, so you can probably get more from him, her, it, it, probably. Um, the, the installation that you see, the embodiment, is the work of art, and it's back what you mentioned, it's actually back to the artificial and the art artifact, by Professor Vladimir Valashevich from the Belgrade uh, um, art, art University. And uh, the AI behind or within it, which is in the cloud, uh, is the work of Daria Medic, who is the um, digital art expert uh, Diplo Foundation. Now, Kualo uh, uses the open source um, 
GPT-2 transformer-based language model, so actually neural network, which was fed with the transcripts of the AI discussions from the previous years of the IGF. So it, it actually learned from what we discussed in all the previous times, uh, coming up to our um, own opinion uh, as, as a sort of a wrapping up of this discussion. Uh, so it is the AI that was learning about what we discussed about AI. So I turn to, to Kualo to, um, well, for maybe the closing and wrap up, uh, wrap up of the session before, uh, before uh, 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 Olga actually does it. Kualo. So I can only say that we are very happy to participate in this process because it brings together the stakeholders, the companies, the public officials and also the academics to discuss how to proceed with this process and to agree a framework. For this discussion, the idea is to come up with a framework that addresses the different issues and adhere by the stakeholders to establish the truth from the rumors. <laughs> I think the first word that comes to my mind is system. So if we want to do it properly, we have to do it right. We have to do it right when we talk about AI. This is a big problem we have to solve. And this unconscious bias is what we need to start looking at. This is what we have now. We can say this kind of research has been done in human behavior. We can refer to other kind of research that focuses on machine learning systems. Not only the AI systems, but try to understand the origins of these systems and how they are working. How did they get here? What are the implications of this for the social contract? We can go ahead and use this feedback loop and try to identify patterns and then fix the answers if we need to. But we need to make sure we capture the breadth of the issues and not the single, two or three classes of questions that we are going to ask ourselves. Statisticians say something like 60% accuracy is possible with just model training. But what is the meaningfulness of the data set really going to be if we only capture the aspects that are meaningful to a certain extent? What if there are problems that we can't capture? How can we make some features meaningful others are documented and or highlighted? What if there are non-significant features that we need to reform? It's the intergovernmental organization that translates all kinds of different languages, from French to English, from the United Nations, industry groups, academia and more, to understand the principles and how they are applied in the private sector. So, what do we do? We take a seat at the table, for the users as well. Thank you. Thank you, Kualo. So, uh, I can only say that we are very... Thank you, Kualo. Uh, well, uh, it's important to underline this was not, this is not fake. No one wrote it. This is actually what came out of the learning process of the AI from what we have been discussing in the last years at the, AI and at the IGF. There are quite some interesting statements over there. And I was uh, asked by, the, uh, by the, the, the artist to mention that the cue in all of that is also uh, using the, uh, the, the voice modulation, which is somewhere genderless voice, basically, uh, which was produced by another uh, set of artists. Uh, so to signal that we can find the, uh, the gender neutral uh, artificial intelligence or robots in the future. Uh, well, Olga, back to you. Uh, okay. For those of you that want to follow up, you can join the session this afternoon. Well, can you, was can you try to summarize this? I think that he can be the next uh, moderator in the, in the next IGF. He, maybe he can do that all the, online uh, along with us. So some, some reflections, I, I took some notes, and I, I think in, in, in any way, it's, it's not, I, I will focus on some issues, but in any way, it's diminishing the other comments that, that were done. Um, the fact that human rights and, and ethical frameworks are there and are useful, we, do, we don't need to rephrase them, but the challenge is in the process to implementing them. So that, that's where we have to put the focus on. Um, we have to measure the, what, what success means. Uh, not only looking at the utility, but looking also the success in relation with society, with human treatment, how do we make this, all these ideas happen in, in reality, uh, expanding the notion of success beyond only the, the utility. We should be leading by example. Uh, 
Mm. Uh, I like that very much, and uh, the fact that your organization has many females, that's good, but that's my only comment. Um, the role of, com of communicators and journalists, I, I found that very interesting, and I wonder if, if our journalists and com communicators in, in developing countries do have the knowledge and the tools for that. Maybe that's something that we should focus on and, and teach them and help them. Um, the role of small and medium enterprises in innovation, I think that is a reality in developing economies. I wonder if that happens if in developed economies. I wonder if it's the same, and it's, it's a question in, in, in developing countries. Um, who trains the users? Uh, the users were not very... Um, uh, signaled in, in the tool, so who trained us to do the right decision in, in using technology in, in buying. The multi-stakeholder dialogue is important the, and the challenge of multidisciplinary dialogue. How we move from our learning uh, knowledge and experience to understand and, and put in the, in the shoes of other uh, colleagues that have other, uh, other ideas and other knowledges. Um, I think uh, that's all I got. Uh, and the, the importance of this uh, IGF, high-level panels, all, the, all these spaces, and hopefully they are really not biased and have the participation of uh, different countries from all over the world, different stakeholders, different ideas and different knowledges, so we can build a better space for humans and uh, development for all of us. So many, many other questions uh, left open, but that there is a lot of food for thought for the next year. Huh? Yeah, yeah, many questions. I hope you, you, you have many questions in mind. That's the idea of the session. I love the, the, our other participant, I think. AI has to be yeah. at the table. Well, thank you all. A round of applause for all of you for yeah. joining us today, and see you at a, at a coffee. <laughs> yes, and also many thanks to the MAG members that organized these, uh, these sessions. And they are not in the stage, but they are real, the, the ones that made it happen. Natasha and team, Conchettina, all, all of you, thank you for our panelists. I enjoy it very much. Thank you, Vlada, for... Thank you, Olga. Okay, have a nice day. Time for coffee. Thank Bye. you.